Anger by Alexander Augustus Narrated by Daniel Collard Volume 1, Chapter 4 Next morning, the man woke at dawn with a chorus of robins and garden warblers. He slipped the cord off his neck and splashed water on his face from the bathroom sink. Perhaps last night had been nothing more than a terrible dream. There were three unfinished horses to complete, and three mysterious skull keys sat waiting on the desk. Elizabeth had studied the physique of a great many horses, and she enjoyed this artist's exploration of the form. He had long piano player fingers, which stroked and pressed assuredly at the wax of the model, and handled nimbly the wooden implements which scoured and shaped the surface. He worked quickly, glancing often at the reference images pinned to the wall. Every now and then, the bronze horse would tick, and the boy's attention would dart towards it. He had made the model. He knew what lay beneath the clicking, flashing facade. Elizabeth thought it must be a bomb. What was he planning to blow up? Was he going to lure pearls here with his treasures and blow them away? Or target the government? Or perhaps the Shell Corps offices here in London? Or even the Shell Labs in her beloved Balmoral estate? The apartment building? Or just his own tortured self? There were no shortage of targets Elizabeth could imagine. The truth is, he hadn't decided what he wanted to blow up, or if he even did want to blow anything up. The threat of ultimate violence was the last crumb of power he had left in this new world, but instead of focusing on the destruction, he poured himself into the beautiful presentation of the package it would come in. He continued chipping away at his model until the phone rang. Hello, is this Cup? asked a man's voice at the other end of the phone. Uh. Yeah, that's me, replied the young man. Can I ask who's calling? He spoke in a careful tone. Yeah, mate, this is Mikey, replied the voice. Cup jumped to his feet like a startled rabbit. The voice continued, but Cup cut him off. Mikey, listen, I need to get all four horses cast in bronze before the foundries close down. Not one sculptor repeated, but four different pieces, one-offs. Like the pictures I sent you originally. Cup paced around the room, agitated by the conversation. Nah, mate, I'm sorry for the confusion, but I thought you just wanted the one piece four times. Honestly, this is booked to be our last job before closure. That's all we can manage. Cup was now at the window, staring into the courtyard and thinking furiously. He glanced at a pile of metal treasures in the corner of the room. What if I can provide you with the bronze? I have my own and I can get the models to you by the end of the week. That's not the issue, replied Mikey. The situation is that we are no longer running after the end of the month. No foundry is. It's not essential work. Cup's nose quivered, and he rubbed it with a closed palm. He quietly handled the money plant leaves he'd sprouted downstairs and placed in tiny pots on the window. No, I mean... Well, it's essential for me. This is meant to be my last project. Listen, mate. If you can get the second horse to me by the end of the day, we'll see what we can do. Cup held the phone from his face to check the date and said, Mikey, about payment, but was cut off. One last job, okay? Just get the work here. Cup pulled some bubble wrap from a pile of assorted materials and began measuring it up, phone pinned between his shoulder and ear. Mikey, this is very important. About the patina. The first was white, but not the second. The second must be burnished bright red, like a flame, you understand? Like we discussed, like a flame. The third is black, dark, matte, even coverage and pure. 
the blackest black, like a shadow you look into and you can't see any edges of anything. And the last one will be pale green, like illness, Mikey, like phlegm or jade. You know, you have the examples I sent you. Mikey paused. Cut. These are trying times, mate. Your mates, your family. Have you got anyone there with you? No, replied Cup. See you later. You could join us, you know. I put in a word. A few of us have got work up at the labs. Mikey's offer was sincere. No, I failed the psych evaluation, said Cup, reaching for the scissors. I cannot transform, I cannot work. <laughs> See you later. He hung up. Cup! A strange name for a peculiar boy, Elizabeth thought. She realised that many kind and valuable souls would get left behind in the rush to build a new, more insulated world. This poor young man can no longer find power in the togetherness and convening strength of family, friendship and good neighbourliness, she thought. Though he is a little odd, this is a terrible shame. Cup sat back at the table and worked feverishly till evening. He carved the details of the second horse with a scalpel and set of chopsticks, which he continually recut for purpose. Elizabeth wanted to be held by the young man. Not in a naughty way, but there were certain things which she was only able to learn from being held, and Cup's inner motives were so alien to her. He was clearly ill, and as a concerned elder she wanted to know to what extent. What kind of curious shell would this boy transform into? She wondered. Without my help he will die in this place. But she was concerned also for herself. This is urgent. The age of money will end and I will be banished to a museum or an incinerator. She imagined being roasted into particles or buried alive for an eternity. It seems we are both approaching the dust heap faster than we would like. She turned her attention back to her surface, attempting to summon the energy to roll the edges or change the markings of her shell. Night crept in, and the smoky musk of autumn bonfires lingered in the air. Clouds drew across the sky like poisonous curtains. No stars were visible through the fumes, but the light of some glowing pearls flickered in the distance, hovering high and looking down on the human world. Sometimes pearls would float down between buildings, peering in windows, looking for things lost or stolen, or watching humans go about their messy business. Hours passed while Cup worked. Eventually he stood back, regarding the model for several minutes, rotating it around on the table. He then produced the second skull key from his pocket, placed it into the crown neck of the horse rider, and smiled. Elizabeth watched as Cup lifted the sculpture into an open suitcase and struggled to manoeuvre it out of the door and down the steps. He was gone for several hours, and when he returned without the suitcase, he got straight into bed without brushing his teeth. He lay down and placed the cord around his neck. Elizabeth felt his heart rate slow. Deep, lonely breaths. He lurched down, pulling the restraint tight. Red sores burned where soft tissue stretched and abraded, spluttering little coughs, bulging, fading. Again, his respiratory and circulatory systems were sucking and pumping desperately, chest undulating. Cup's fingers twitched as he counted, over and over. Three, two, one. Slowing, losing the count, losing consciousness now limp. Moments passed, and Elizabeth concentrated on the horror of it all. Oh, how frightful! Oh, God! She thought. He's done it this time! <laughs> Just as before, Cup pulled the restraint off and sucked in the air. <sighs> The light wins once more, he gasped. Relieved in some small way, disappointed in others, he slept. 
Utterly perturbed, Elizabeth searched the man's body and tried to identify the physical ailments which drove him to this madness. She remembered when her corgis slept with paws twitching and tongue drooping as they haired around in their dreams. Cup too was twitching, like a body hanging from the gallows. Such a foolish boy, she thought, but he would not sleep for long. Cup awoke at the sound of an almighty crash. Without warning, a football-sized pearl smashed through the window, scattering shards of glass into the corners of the room, into the haphazard piles of clothes and materials, and all over the remaining horse models. Cup bolted upright, choking on the cord which was still secured around his neck and almost decapitating himself. Having disentangled himself, he darted in front of the models, holding his arms out to protect them from the flailing pearl. No! They're not ready! Elizabeth saw now that it was the same creature from the day before, come to recover its treasure. Cup also recognised the gelatinous see-through body from one of the early high-profile shell reveals on TV. Alexander Boris de Feffel Johnson. We meet at last. Cup muttered with dark amusement. He had always hoped to blow this shell to smithereens. That's why he had spent so long gathering the possessions which Johnson slobbered over. But Cup never truly believed he'd be able to lure him, and now it was all happening so fast he didn't know what to do. The pearl shot out jelly tendrils which solidified in the air and pulled at the walls and ceilings. This was how it manoeuvred itself. Pearl Boris shot liquid at Cup, who darted nimbly to the side. He ducked as the thing splurged another set of tentacles into the room. A gelatinous rope flew over Cup's shoulder and hit one of the horses, dragging it to the floor with a smash and pulling it halfway across the room. No! shouted Cup. Fuck you, Boris Johnson, you fucking used condom, full of stinking, toxic trash! Cup grabbed at his scalpel and slashed at the rubbery tendrils attached to the sculpture. Then he turned the blade to the main bolus of Johnson's shell, slashing and cutting globules. <laughs> Pearl Boris protested. The blade sliced deep into the jelly and clanked against the metal core. The moist surface vibrated, and the bony parts of the core retracted inside the metallic parts. The pearl bounced about, landing near a pile of glittering treasures. There was the crystal scepter. Johnson blew liquid at the bejeweled rod and pulled it inside the jelly body to secure his loot. Weighed down by the scepter, the blob squirmed on top of a laundry pile, spitting liquid over the walls and tearing at Cup's drawings, trying to pull itself up. Cup grabbed a wooden broom and wedged it underneath the flailing pile. With a furious wrench, he catapulted the whole thing out of the window with a motion like a lacrosse serve. Motherfucker! He yelled. The monstrosity tumbled out of the window and crashed to the ground below with a splat and a clunk. It squealed and undulated, leaking into the dirty clothing with which it was enmeshed. The hard parts of the thing locked together and rolled out of their gooey sanctum, evacuating the wet part of the body like an egg yolk separating itself. Pearl Boris rolled off along the street and away, dragging the scepter with it, along with one of Cup's favourite t-shirts, leaving a slug trail behind itself. Cup spotted the crushed money plant leaves with their roots now disembodied and felt boiling rage as Boris rolled away. He leaned out of the window and called after him. Also, fuck you for Brexit! Cup's eyes darted to the other windows in the courtyard, which displayed no motion. He leaned further out. You trapped us all on this fucking island full of fucking mutant Tory scum! That seemed sufficient for the time being. Elizabeth thoroughly disapproved of the vile language Cup was using, but having met Johnson in his human form could not entirely disavow the sentiment. She was quite caught up in the drama of it all. Appalled, of course, but with a lingering spark of pride that this young man's plan had almost worked. Oh, you funny oddity, you do need some guidance, she thought, concerned that he might have just lost the final vestige of motivation in his life. 
Cup turned back to the horse model, now lying with its head snapped off, punctured with shards of glass. Famine, he sighed. Starved of an audience, starved of validation, and soon starved of food. He set the horse back on the table and fingered the glass shards now protruding from its face, mane and legs, making it look a bit like an angry blowfish. This is my house, Cup said to himself. The room was now bitterly cold, with torrents of icy air ploughing through the broken window. He was wearing only the blue briefs he had had on in bed, and his smooth, pale body was coming out in goosebumps. He wrapped a blanket round his shoulders and stapled fabric over the open window. He flipped the kettle on, and it filled the room with steam and a comforting hiss. Cup sank down on the corner of his bed, with his head in his hands. He pushed his fingers through his head of wild hair, and a clump of it came away in his hand. <coughs> Cup spluttered out a thick line of red saliva. He picked up the scalpel from where it had landed and gripped it with a clenched fist, knuckles pressed white and nails digging ridges into his palms. He slowed his breathing and placed the tip of the scalpel on his knee. He pressed in as much as he could bear. He flinched. A prick of blood appeared. Despite his ritual asphyxiations, Cup did not enjoy pain. He turned the scalpel to his wrist and pressed the blade down on one of the protruding blue veins. Transfixed. Slowly. Pop! The kettle had boiled and it was time to make a cup of tea. Cup was a coward when it came to pain and had only practiced suffocation. He had not yet decided whether he would hang himself or blow himself up. He might have sealed the windows and turned the gas on had it not already been cut off. He scanned the room, now freezing and littered with glass, and set about ordering things. Scraping up the glass, sorting piles, and putting his few worldly possessions back in their correct places. He reached again for the broom. Vroom! Elizabeth felt a great sweep across the floor, then a whirling crash from skirting board to doorframe as the envelope was dislodged. Perhaps he will find me, Elizabeth thought. This is my chance. She felt her energy rise, and her surface fluttered as she imagined finally being held once more, the freedom of escaping the envelope. Boom! The broom hit a chair leg, and the weight of a wooden stool fell onto Elizabeth like a great tree. Her mind was focused by a feeling akin to adrenaline, and she felt as though her surface were flashing and changing but of course she could not know without someone else to observe it. She was trying to communicate through her skin again. What should I try to say? She thought, and landed on, Dear Cup, this five pound note is the shell of your queen. Do not kill yourself. Do not blow anyone up. I want to help you take me to Balmoral Castle immediately. But no, this message was too long and frankly absurd. She needed to know if she even had the power to communicate. Hello, she thought. But this was no good either. She needed something actionable so she could know if he had read it. She decided on... Look under your bed. There was nothing under the bed. It was just a test. Cup righted the chair, knelt down, and picked up the envelope containing Elizabeth. Oh gosh, I can save us! Let me save us! Elizabeth was vibrating with excitement. She pushed her mind out to the surface of her note form, and pushed and pushed, reciting, Look under your bed! Look under your bed! Look under your bed! Cup paused. He flipped the envelope round, and then back again in confusion, then looked to the door, as if assessing how it had made its way into his apartment. He slid the letter from the envelope. Elizabeth felt an incredible lightness come over her as the paper constraints loosened on either side. She felt her edges crinkle and curve along her paper wrinkles as the card opened. Warm light flooded into her sensory field. Cup's hands as he handled her were cold and stiff. 
Inside his body, Elizabeth felt something growing, some invasive kind of presence. He was not at all well. His grip loosened and Elizabeth fell with a flutter, along with the other notes. Cup was aware of the money, but he did not kneel down to pick it up immediately. He was transfixed by the letter. Never mind that! Look at me! Elizabeth screeched, but the room was silent. With a bang, the broom dropped to the floor. Cup stood motionless. Elizabeth cast her mind back. Who was the strange little woman who brought me here? But she had been plucked straight from the cash machine and folded directly into the envelope, with no real chance to observe her deliverer. After a minute, Cup went slowly to the kettle, as he did in times of anxiety. The mood had shifted, as it so often did in this apartment, but this time there was surrender in his demeanour. Cup held the letter close to his nose and read aloud, A formal written warning was previously issued regarding the closure of these premises. He glanced at a pile of letters on the sideboard. Electricity will no longer be available to this sector from November 1st. He paused again and looked at his remaining uncast horses. He continued. You have 30 days to report to the Ministry of Housing for relocation. Failure to comply will result in physical removal of tenants from the property. Coordinators have been instructed to enclose compensation for your journey to the nearest Ministry Registration Centre. His phone beeped. A text from Mikey. Sorry mate, foundry grinding to a halt. Second horse impossible. Here for collection when you can mate. Truly am sorry. Everything was going wrong. No! God damn it! No! Cup screamed and ripped clumps of hair from his head, which surrendered loosely. The kettle hissed. Cup bent over to pick Elizabeth up, but then hovered, leaned forward slowly on his hands, and brought his knees to the ground, moving gently. He placed his head below his shoulders and assumed a kind of fetal position. He quietly hummed to himself as he massaged his balding scalp. He needed comforting, and Elizabeth wanted to provide that for him. But his hard surface did not crack entirely. He pulled himself out of the curled-up pose. He took the five-pound note in two hands. Elizabeth could feel his magpie eyes on her skin, and knew this would be the turning point for Cup and herself, that they would save one another. She could get him the help he needed. He could deliver her back to the safety of the shell labs to complete her transformation. Look under your bed! She willed, organising and aligning all the energy in her being to form these words, these symbols which would save them both. Cup's hands were clammy and pulsating with a powerful heartbeat. The hissing of the kettle grew louder. The appliance rattled and spat. Elizabeth held her non-existent breath. She pushed her mind harder than ever before to the surface of her shell form and the patterns etched there. Look under your bed! Cup sat up and pulled Elizabeth's edges flat. He read aloud. I have nothing to offer but blood, toil, tears and sweat. Elizabeth's heart sank. He had not seen her message after all. He was quoting Winston Churchill. The kettle clicked. Cup set Elizabeth on the windowsill, secured under a pile of coins. Cup made himself tea. He had one finished bomb. Only one. He addressed the horse directly. You were meant to blow up something important. Something that would be noticed. But I guess you'll have to settle for blowing me up instead. He slid his dexterous fingers around the knobs, tools and treasures embedded in its surface. With a sigh, he lifted his arm to the skull key and began to turn. Click. 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 Elizabeth felt the weight of mechanisms rotating inside and heard a ticking. Cup's heartbeat was pumping loudly in his chest. The horse was a ticking bomb 
and Cup clung to it with the white knuckles of a skeleton. His eyes were closed, his breath held, and his whole body braced. Moments passed and the ticking died down. Cup loosened himself, stood back, and inspected the object. Hmm, not working. Cup had never been good at mechanical things. He clicked the kettle back on and made another cup of tea. Good golly gosh! exclaimed Elizabeth. What shenanigans are afoot? This is frightful behaviour! Cup sat on the corner of his bed, the ceramic mug warming his hands. He reached for a pile of books on the floor and picked one up. He stroked the cover of Paradise Lost and recited to himself. Horror and doubt distract his troubled thoughts, and from the bottom stir the hell within him, for within him hell he brings. He approached the horse once more, and without hesitation began winding it up. He clenched his eyes and held very tightly to his cup of tea as the clicking resumed. Click, 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 and faded out. Annoyed, Cup burrowed through his treasures and pulled out an Oscar trophy of some transformed actor taken from a mansion he'd looted in Knightsbridge. He began to pat the horse. Clunk, clack, 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 clunk, clonk. He hit the horse with the trophy like a monk ringing a bell, with his eyes clenched shut. But nothing happened. My goodness! Elizabeth was flapping around in the breeze. This is quite ridiculous, quite farcical. Bang! Bang! Ping! Clunk! Bang! Cup was now wildly flailing with the Oscar, and cracking whole chunks of the pure white patina off the horse. God damn it! Bang! He pushed the whole thing to the floor with a crash. Still, nothing happened. No explosion came. He wrapped his arms around the horse and hefted it to the window. Rolling it slowly over the chipped windowsill, the horse slipped and pinched the skin of his index finger. Cup yelled. He was annoyed now. He ripped away the stapled fabric and pushed the metal horse out of the window. A second of silence was followed by an almighty crash in the courtyard below, but no explosion. Oh Jesus, everything is so goddamn hard! He snapped. Fine, I'll hang myself then. He stalked to the bathroom, pulled the shower cord, and slid his belt from his trousers. He held his breath and closed his eyes, trying to ease his frustration, feeling his heart beat faster at first, then slow to a steady thud. His skin temperature dropped. He pulled his clothes off and dropped them into a pile. He held the shower head at arm's length, so as to avoid the cold water shocking his skin. The water became warm in his hand, and he stepped into the rotting cupboard. He showered until his muscles relaxed. Cup kneeled on the floor of the shower, took the end of his belt, looped it around the top of the radiator, and pulled it tight. He did not sit back up. The thick leather dug into his neck, making it red and sore. Stop this at once! Elizabeth didn't know what to do. Just then, somewhere in the distance, came the clack of high heels. The funny little woman who had dropped Elizabeth off was rushing into the courtyard to inspect the commotion. Her hazmat suit was hastily arranged and flapped as she ran to the battered metal horse. Her eyes shut up to the broken window of Cup's apartment. Oh, no you haven't! She screeched as she whipped up the stairs like a whirlwind. Water was pounding on Cup's body, and Elizabeth was unable to distinguish his heartbeat. She could feel the water rising in the shower. It was filling up. Was Cup sitting on the plug hole? Seconds passed like hours. The woman was now bashing on the door. You! Sir! You're flooding the hallway! Sir! What are you doing? 
Her heavy chandelier of metal keys shook in her hands as she fumbled for the right one. Right, I'm coming in. The woman opened the door and hurried to the bathroom. Cup was limp and blue. A ghostly arm hung out from the shower door. Not another one, she muttered. She trod carefully to avoid getting her shoes wet. She reached into the shower and turned off the water. She was not shocked by the sight of him. To Elizabeth's disgust, the woman took a step back, observing Cup hanging. <laughs> not what you would call a complete hanging, she snorted. She took a quick look around the room, glancing at the piles of clothes and treasures, and clicking her knuckles together. Total state, she moaned. What have you done to yourself? You should be en route to the ministry by now. She approached Cup slowly and lifted her acrylic pointed finger to his wrist, pressing down. His lips were blue, his eyes half open and rolling back in his head. The woman held her phone to her ear. Unfinished, she said as she brushed against Cup's fourth and final horse. She lifted the dog-eared and scribbled on books from the pile by the bed and read the names one by one. Paradise Lost, Book of Revelations, The Prince, His Dog... Her grip tightened on the phone. Yes, I need an ambulance, she barked. She gravitated towards the broken window and saw the five pound note on the windowsill. She picked Elizabeth up with sinewy hands held her to the light as if checking for authentication, and flipped her upside down. Look under your bed, she read. The woman turned, knelt down and looked under the bed. Yes, yes, well I just found him, okay? She said into the phone. The woman surveyed the negative space under Cup's bed in disappointment, then picked a knife from the work table turned once more to Cup and cut the belt loose. His head hit the floor with a thud. She looked back at Elizabeth, whose surface now read, Take me to Buttercake, AB355TB, reward. The woman was startled. She dropped her phone on the sodden carpet. The words changed in front of her very eyes. Previously, Elizabeth had observed how, in calmer moments, Cup would sit on the floor of the shower, close his eyes, and smooth shampoo foam over his ears like a plasterer, so that all sounds were insulated as if underwater. He visualised himself drifting away, sucked along a jet stream into the open ocean. He visualised drowning and never having to emerge. It was a lifelong fixation. Elizabeth knew that this was what he wanted, but Elizabeth did not want this for him. And, unbeknownst to Elizabeth, her interference would give birth to me. And upon my forehead, the name of Mischief. Mm -hmm.